Bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. Merci pour votre présence ce matin, très tôt de matin. Je suis Stephen Toop, le nouveau président de la Fédération des sciences humaines, et je suis ravi de vous accueillir ce matin. I'm honored to welcome all of you here for my first big thinking lecture as president of the Federation. Before we start, I want to acknowledge the support of the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council uh, for this series. It really is uh, a wonderful collaboration that the Federation has with uh, the uh, Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council. Now, as many of you will know, our Big Thinking series brings research from the social sciences and humanities closer to people who can use it to inform decisions about policies that affect the lives of Canadians and, indeed, of those outside of the country. I'm so pleased that over the last 20 years, we've been able to bring to Parliament Hill leading researchers from across the country and also from across the disciplines of the humanities and social sciences. For example, in recent times, we've heard from Jack Mintz, Guy Laforet, Kent Roach, and Wendy Craig. Each brought a very different and unique perspective uh, on the issues that we face as Canadians. They're bringing their evidence and their analysis to bear on important questions of public policy. I hope, because this is our goal, that these researchers actually help us to question our assumptions to challenge our own beliefs as we shape Canada as we all want it to be. In that spirit, I am delighted to introduce today's speaker, who will be sharing insights from her research on an extremely timely subject. Dr. Marjorie Griffin Cohen is an economist and professor of political science and gender, sexuality, and women's studies at Simon Fraser University. As former president of UBC, I'm delighted to welcome a Simon Fraser colleague. With last week's budget, discussions of the Canadian economy are, of course, still very much in the air. Today, Dr. Cohen will unpack some commonly held assumptions about economic prosperity and austerity and share insights from her research on the effects of different government policies in Canada on people, women and men, and on the wider economy. Nous avons le plaisir d'offrir l'interprétation simultanée de cette conférence par téléphone. Veuillez composer le numéro indiqué, j'espère, sur votre table pour y accéder. Joignez-nous maintenant à moi pour accueillir la professeure Marjorie Griffin Cohen. Thank you, Stephen, for that introduction, and I really want to thank the Federation for this breakfast and, um, and a chance to talk to you this morning. Um, I'm going to come to my conclusion first. Uh, austerity as government policy is not good. It's not good for the economy, and it's not good for people. Um, so um, this is counter to the theory which exists right now, and the theory that has guided governments, both federally and provincially, throughout Canada for about the past 20 years. This theory is called, and it's an odd name, expansionary austerity, and sometimes expansionary fiscal contraction. Now these terms in themselves are contradictory. Expansionary fiscal contraction is an odd term. But the ideas behind the policy are intriguing, and because they're so prevalent, should be tested to see if they're true. Especially because Canada prides itself as being one country that has performed very well under regimes that are downsizing the public sector, um, re that has reductions in significant social programs, has substantial and ongoing tax cuts, and institutes various wage recession uh, strategies all throughout the country. But the general idea is that if governments will institute regimes of austerity, the economy will experience a slight initial contraction, but ultimately will flourish and experience an expansion. So I want to talk, up, first of all, about the assumptions of expansionary austerity. Governments, so the assumption is that governments that focus less on providing social programs and more on supporting the activities of the private corporation, both within the country and outside the country, will improve economic performance. 
and they will increase growth, and that will increase growth and tax revenue, sort of miraculously. So the, the, the thinking is that reductions in social spending to lower the debt and reduce taxes, coupled with wage suppression, will make any country that's dependent on exports, as is Canada, much more competitive. So that will stimulate the inflow of money and increase exports and stimulate long-term growth. So the expectation of lower taxes, then, will make people, they're going to expect taxes to keep getting lower. So the idea is that because of that expectation, they will increase their spending habits. And so it's not just people, but also corporations. And corporations will not be crowded out by government. They'll take up the slack that government is, is, uh, is in areas where government's abandoning their activities. So the result is that the economy will grow and government revenues will actually increase. So even though you have a drop in taxes because of the expansion in the whole economic uh, size, um, that will bring in more dollars. Now, these are, this is a theory from two Italian economists, Francesco Giavazzi and Marco Pagano, um, where they experience, they compared two countries, the experiences of two countries, Ireland and Denmark, and found that the fiscal consolidations that they made in the 1980s did actually improve economic performance. Um, <clears throat> sometimes now we know this as the German point of view, and the Germans certainly, as we know, are instituting austerity uh, in Europe, and particularly in Greece, or at least they're hoping to. So in what follows, I want to look at the effect of expansionary, expansionary austerity on Canada from 1980 to the present. And these are the things that I'm interested in, in showing. I want to show that the type of government spending matters, and most significantly, what happens when there are serious reductions on counter-cyclical programs. That is, these are the programs that kick in when the economy is, is declining. Um, the second thing I want to show is that governments now have more or less abandoned the idea that economic crises can be avoided. And they now only deal with crises when they arrive. So the economy is becoming increasingly volatile with lower, uh, lower low points. And the third one is that austerity has a negative impact on the economy in terms of low growth and people in terms of increased inequality, lower relative wages, and poor working conditions. So um, first I want to look very briefly at what the theory about austerity replaced as what was common government policy in Canada. Until the rise of austerity took hold, beginning in the 1980s, but really coming into effect in a serious way in the 1990s, governments more or less operated on the idea that economic crisis could be prevented if governments managed the economy appropriately. Um, in the post-Second World War period in Canada and in other countries, um, the governments worked hard at avoiding the kind of economic disaster that had happened after the First World War. The main fear was that um, returning soldiers would increase the rate of unemployment and you'd have a depression as you had after the First World War. Um, so what they wanted to do was, would be to expand the economy after the depression. Um, and the other important idea was that they couldn't return to budget surpluses too rapidly because that would take money out of the economy. So attempts to... Uh, prevent or mitigate the severity of the potential crisis required planning. And Canada and the U.S. and, 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 uh, and England as well gained considerable experience at planning the economy during World War II, an exercise that was not abandoned as soon as the war was over. The planning was substantial and extended beyond war work to include activities ranging from uh, industrial to social aspects of the economy, or what we call social reproduction. It's basically how you provide things people need to exist, uh, but to be active within the society. And it also is important to improve the quality and the quantity of the labor force. So planning for social reproduction was new to a capitalist economy like, uh, like Canada's, and, and at least to the extent that it was undertaken in the war itself, but it did become a permanent feature of the system immediately after the war period. So one of the major tools of economic planning, aside from 
manipulating the interest rate, various kinds of monetary policy, are strong social spending and particularly spending on programs that act as automatic stabilizers and have a counter-cyclical effect. These were crucial in limiting the damage of an economic crisis should one arise. I mean, you are all familiar with these programs. Unemployment insurance is a very important one, social assistance. But there are other types of programs that kind of kick in whenever there's a downturn. Uh, pension benefits, people tend to retire early when there's a economic crisis. Um, health benefits. Um, People sometimes will use them if they don't have unemployment and benef benefits. Uh, payments for disabilities. And, of course, social housing and education. Actually, people tend to go back to universities when they can't get jobs. So uh, these are some things that are very important counter-cyclical stabilizers. Um, other and very important role of these social institutions is, of course, simply to meet people's needs. Um, they are equity enhancing, so they've been extremely important for marginalized groups, particularly women, but also racialized groups. In that, and that they're important there because they provide the ability of people to participate in society and participate politically. And some, it, that's just been critical for all groups. So what is important is um, the ideas of fiscal contraction um, really does fly in the face of what we are known as the Keynesian solutions to problems, to economic problems, which was basically you would try to increase demand and there, and that would, and increase employment and that would increase growth. So, so it, it, it really is, has been a revolution in ideas about how governments should function. So with the rise of a, uh, expansionary austerity, what we do have now is whenever there is a crisis, we have attempt at crisis containment. Uh, once it arises, and more of a focus on, less of a focus than preventing a crisis itself. So, um, so basically, uh, now the stimulus spending becomes very short term and is primarily focused on tax breaks and infrastructure spending. It's anything on the social programs is extremely short term and does not last. So what I want to do now is to show you, uh, to give you some uh, idea <clears throat> of governments, of Canadian government spending. Um, as, as Canadians, we usually think that we're pretty good in our social programs, particularly in relationship to the United States. And this is kind of a complex graph. So what I'm going to do is explain to you that I have taken six, uh, uh, five, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, six uh, OECD countries, and these are the wealthy countries in the world, <clears throat> and tried to compare Canada's performance on social spending with this. And this is not just federal spending, it is also includes all government spending in Canada. And these are OECD statistics. So um, <clears throat> it's always difficult to compare countries, so you have to trust this, this kind of, of way that they're doing. So uh, what you see is that in the 1980s, um, Canada was third from the bottom in social spending. You can see that on the left, where that red line, that sort of dark red line there. And this increased very dramatically until 1992, um, when social spending was 21% of the national <clears throat> income, the GDP. And you'll also see <clears throat> that in, in 1992, it is be above the OECD average. In that, that's a, a kind of a light blue color there, uh, above OECD average. But what you see happening in the 1990s is a very steep decline. All countries declined somewhat, but this was the steepest decline Canada had. <clears throat> and this was at beginning a very radical change in uh, the very beginning of radical change in Canada altogether. So the decline is very persistent in the proportion of social spending to national income until the 2008 recession when government stepped in to control the crisis. But this was very short-lived. Canada, as you'll see on the right, 
is now at the bottom of these countries in social spending as a relationship to the national income. And it's a very far cry from where it was in, the, uh, in, in 1991 and 92. So um, one thing I want to note is, is, is that this isn't true of all government spending. It's only true of social spending. And this is what's particularly interesting. And because of limitation and not wanting to show you a lot of gra complex graphs, um, uh, I, I do want to tell you that Canada has more or less retained its rank as a spender in total government expenditures as about third of this whole group and above the OECD average. So what we're doing is we're still spending lots of money, but we've shifted that spending and shifting it away from social programs. Um, <clears throat> so uh, so, so what, what we are is third after Sweden and the UK and actually above Germany and the US as a proportion of total total government spending as a proportion to national income. So that's always uh, fairly interesting. So it's not that government spe Canada spends less than other rich countries, but that we spend much more uh, on other things rather than social programs. So, um, so th my point is that the type, kind of social spending matters a lot. And we're going to look at, um, at this slide, which is... Um, these are the tax multipliers. This is something that the government has indicated itself is, is an issue. These figures come uh, in relationship to reports on the stimulus package from the end of the, uh, of, of the last Great Recession, and they indicate how much government spending um, has an impact on the economy. So basically, a dollar spent can have fairly little impact if most of it goes out of the country. If you're giving it to somebody who's going to spend outside of the country or a corporation that's going to spend it outside uh, of the country. So the multiplier is the reference to the total increase in income from a particular increase in spending. So, um, so this is in, a very instructive because you'll see there's a big difference between money that is foregone because of tax cuts, and as you'll see here, business tax measures really do take money out of the economy altogether. Uh, whereas if you spend on the people who are unemployed or if you spend on infrastructure, um, then, you will, um, then you will actually be stimulating the economy. So the point is that governments know what the effect of their actions are going to be on the level on the economic activity. So, um, so what I want, the big question then is, has this idea of austerity actually improved economic performance? And the promise is that it will over a long period of time. So I wanted to look at this. So what I'm going to show you here are Canada's growth rates. And what you can see is that they fluctuate quite a bit over a considerable period of time. And by the way, I do want to say that um, there are many, many reasons for changes in, in the growth rate. I'm not implying that spending on social programs alone affects the growth rate, but it is one of the components. The others are things like the value of the dollar. We know that that has a big impact. Uh, the price of primary exports, particularly because we're a big exporting nation. Uh, demand for economies, the state of the world economy, those sorts of things matter. It's just that there, are, there is a correlation here that is important. So austerity was instituted in a major way in the 1990s in Canada. So since 1994, um, there has been a trend for the growth rate to fall, and that's that dotted line you see there. Um, and so it is this downward trajectory, and there's no sign of that changing. Um, that is just what is happening how. 1994 was a particularly important year, as you in Ottawa will probably remember who have been, been around then. Um, there was a change by the federal government in direct spending on specific areas within province, health, education, and social assistance, to transfers that it did not tie to specific programs. And there were cuts to the total amount as well. There were also very dramatic changes in the employment insurance. There was a confiscation of the surplus, and a really a dramatic reduction in the proportion of people who were unemployed who would receive uh, benefits. So uh, women were most directly targeted in that, and we know now that it's, it's a very small proportion. It's about a third of the women who become unemployed are eligible for benefits now. 
But we also see, at this time, a very serious beginning of changes within provinces with rollbacks in wages and in, in the public sector. And these, uh, these have been kind of, uh, kind of consistent. So now what I want to do is to look at what the effect is on people. Um, this, on this side, on the left side of the side, of the slide, you will see the percent of social spending to GDP. So I've, I'm trying to do these two things together. And the right shy, side measures the level of inequality in Canada. This is the Gini coefficient. So in the Gini coefficient, zero means total equality. Everybody gets exactly the same. And a one means total inequality. One person has it all. So you see what has been happening here. Inequality was dropping in Canada during the 1980s. Um, and inequality rises as social spending to GDP goes down. There's, there's a, there is a real strong correlation there. So any improvement, the, uh, you'll see there was some slight improvement uh, where they converged during, during the 2000, 2010 when government social spending was up temporarily. Um, so th this seems uh, fairly indicative that spo social spending is very important in order to not have income inequality rise too high. Uh, this is another one of those complicated graphs, um, and it's a messy slide, and I apologize, but I have tried to single out Canada there. Um, as you can see, the reduction in labor share of the national incomes of all countries has declined considerably since the 1980s. And Canada has always lagged behind other countries, but it has become much worse since 1990. Now of these six countries, only Australia has a lower level of compensation for labor uh, than Canada. Um, we also have, at the same time, a very serious deterioration in working conditions. Most provinces have revised employment standards, there's employment standards legislation or the labor code, uh, so that people receive very, very much less protection at work. Um, low wages are part of government strategies for economic success in provinces like mine, which is British Columbia, and there's a constant contracting out of, of, uh, of government work in the public sector so that they can avoid the benefits of uh, unionization within the public sector. So a regular job where someone works every day, all day for the entire year is now mighty hard to find. And precarious is the term that we use for a huge proportion of new entrants into the labor force. And many, many of these are women or immigrants or people of color. Um, so uh, we now expect and demand multiple earners in families. It's a very, very rare family that can exist on one income. Um, and, uh, and these are part of the problems that we're seeing. Um, I have a neighbor who is a bank teller. Uh, she's, she's worked for one of the big, big uh, national banks that last year had a profit of two and a half billion dollars. And uh, she can't get full-time work. She can, they promise her 30 hours a week. She can't get full-time work. She's worked there 19 years. But if they, she does get full-time work, then they'd have to pay her benefits, and they don't want to do that. So um, now what's the most recent thing that happened is that they couldn't give her 30 hours. They said they couldn't, but they made it up by taking it out for a holiday. They made it up by taking it out of her... Um, her vacation pay, which is illegal, and the bank knows it, of course, and she knows it, but she knows she can't complain. There's nothing she could do. She could lose her job. These are the kinds of things that are happening and that we are allowing to happen in, in Canada. Um, so uh, this, this is just one slide I want to show you. Um, this is a, a slide indicating the volatility, and the volatility is the difference between the growth rates each year. So what you can see is that since the 90s, we are having more and more um, uh, uh, we're, we're having a lot of volatility in the economy, which is normal, I mean, we do in Canada, but that the lows are getting a bit lower, and this is probably. So, um, in Canada, we are not having less government. Our government is strong, and it's very active. But we just have less government directed toward meeting people's needs. Um, government does regulate the economy, but it has shifted mightily from market controlling activities, that is where it tried to make sure that people's needs were met, um, 
and is primarily now interested in market expanding activities directed toward the corporate sector. Um, I, you know, you may recently have seen, for example, the funding that went to, that is going to Volkswagen for the expansion of their firms in Mexico and the United States. Um, it's hard to see how this is going to benefit Canada. There are no requirements that it do. Um, and also, we see this also in our development policy, which is very, very tied, as some of you will know, to the kind, to, um, to corporate activities and funding corporations. So, Expansionary austerity has not improved economic performance in Canada, and the severe reductions in social spending may contribute to economic volatility in the country. Clearly, government does recognize that social expenditures can improve the economic situation. That's why it improved its performance considerably during 2008 and 10. Way back in, in the 1980s, Margaret Thatcher very famously said, there is no such thing as society. I imagine you remember that, some of you. Um, there are individual men and women, and there are families, she said. And no government can do anything except through people, and people must look to themselves first. At the time, the nastiness of Thatcher and Reagan policies seemed to escape Canada. Um, we sort of felt immune from this because we had decent social programs. But this has shifted as the policies of austerity came into place. The whittling down of social supports amounted to a spectacular about-face in the Canadian policy. So this was a huge reversal in positive and progressive thinking, a shift where people collectively worked to take care of each other, I mean, more or less, I don't want to romanticize the past, but that was at least the goal that we had. Uh, but at a time, people could be optimistic about the future. That is not the message now. It's not the message for young people that I see in universities um, who are told that it's highly unlikely that they will live as well as their parents did, mostly because they will not get a decent, well-paying job. And this is my final slide. Um, a better future is not the message that people hear now. People who need programs that can be best provided through governments, that is national plans for the physically and mentally disabled, dental services, getting eyeglasses, childcare, pharmacare, we can go on and on with things that are necessary. Um, and, but what we are seeing is more and more healthcare and education is privatized. Even the existence of the things that we now have are being gradually and incrementally lost. We have shifted from being a nation where the well-being of people at risk was important, and we commonly call this the welfare state, but well, that term originally meant a state that looked after the well-being of people. It's been, been corrupted, but that is the original term. But we're now a one where people are the risk, and they're the risk for the government. And, and so that is the idea, to divide people, to marginalize people, to make people a problem. So my main message today is that providing industries and surface, services that people need are not simply takeaways that can only be paid, through, paid for through mining, oil extraction, and indri, industries that government deems serious enough to support. These services are for things that people need, but they're also critical for the health of the economy itself. Thank you. Well, thank you uh, very much, uh, Professor Cohen, for what was obviously a very challenging presentation, certainly not uh, uh, perhaps what we might now see as uh, received wisdom, if, we, if I may put it that way. Uh, we now have the opportunity uh, to uh, pose questions. Uh, please use the microphone in the center of the room. Uh, évidemment, vous uh, pouvez poser vos questions ou en anglais ou en français, but whichever language you use, please identify yourself first and, and do try to keep the question short. Thank you very much. Bonjour. Je vais parler en français. Alors, Raymond Côté, député de Beauport-Limoilou. 
Euh, professeur Griffin Cohen, merci beaucoup pour votre présentation. Ça confirme euh, ce que je, je pensais moi-même, évidemment. Et puis, je connais bien aussi le contexte euh, économique euh, durant la Seconde Guerre mondiale et ce qui a suivi. Euh, en fait, les gens ne peuvent pas imaginer à quel point le contrôle de l'économie par l'État allait très, très loin avec un contrôle des prix. Puis c'était autant aux États-Unis qu'au Canada. Alors, c'est... Euh, Faire la promotion de ce genre de mesures maintenant nous ferait passer pour euh, des crypto-communistes ou enfin quelque chose du genre. Euh, je vous cache pas, euh, professeur, évidemment, en tant que politicien, euh, j'ai beau croire en certaines choses ou avoir les faits entre les mains, euh, le vrai défi, c'est la bataille de l'opinion et comme vous l'avez dit, euh, malheureusement, les gens euh, se sont fait convaincre que l'austérité, c'était la, la solution pour sauver en quelque sorte, leurs acquis. Alors, euh, j'aimerais vous entendre, justement, sur ce défi de, bat, de la bataille de l'opinion afin de pouvoir euh, euh, vraiment donner aux gens, en fait, les convaincre que l'espoir passe par une autre voie que de comprimer les dépenses et de baisser euh, les impôts. Merci. Do you want to translate that? Sure. Uh, for, uh, I think the, the idea is really uh, you've given an overview of uh, what is essentially an alternative view of uh, how the economy functions, but it doesn't seem to be a view which is captured right now at least public opinion. And, and part of the issue is really how do you, how do you uh, address that effectively? How do you tell a story which is not, in a sense, the received wisdom in a way that's effective for a public that has now listened for a long time to a dominant narrative, which is not the one that you've offered? Uh, this is the challenge. <laughs> um, and I, I hope there are some people uh, in the media here because it does... It does seem as though we've come down to there's one kind of measure of good government, and that is balancing the budget and getting taxes lower, maybe two, getting taxes lower and balancing the budget. And that has become the only measure, basically, by which any kind of budget is looked at, any kind of thing happens. So this is, a, this is something very difficult to do. And I think what happens is as governments are less and less able to meet people's needs, people become less and less willing to pay for it. And this is happening in Canada. So we're seeing, um, you know, I think that's why people are less willing to pay taxes, although I understand now that that is changing people. But what we're happening is very strange things going on. We're having, you know, the issue of climate change now being one way that governments think they might be able to increase expenditures. And so what they do then is sell off public assets, as they're doing in Ontario, in order to, so that you can have a decent kind of transportation. This is not the way to finance it. It should be financed equitably, and it should be financed decently. So there's a big job here. Uh, I always cringe every time I hear um, somebody talk about something progressive, and then the only response you get from the media is, what's it going to cost? How are you going to pay for it? That's all the only response. So it's crazy now. We have, you know, governments, it costs them almost nothing to borrow anything. Why aren't we providing things people need? York West, which is Toronto. Uh, thank you so very much, Professor. That was uh, an excellent presentation. Thank you. And uh, as a Liberal Member of Parliament, I look at all of those, the deterioration, regardless of when it starts, the reality is of what we're dealing with today. Have you done any work, and I'm, I would suspect that you have, on just the impact those kinds of numbers is having on our local communities. Uh, I certainly am hearing from a huge amount of organizations across Canada that are, you know, knocking on doors of corporations looking for support to continue their important work because they're not getting that support from, from governments across Canada because everybody seems obsessed with austerity. So I'm interested to know if you've done any work on the impact or are we going to wait until five years down the road where it's just so many people have been impacted in such a negative way with a lack of support for, for them to achieve the dreams and things they want to. 
it's such an important observation because what happens is when you have cuts at the federal level, it goes down to the provincial level, and then it all gets pushed down to municipal levels. And that's where people usually are most connected to their governments because that's where these things are provided. And, uh, and so in some ways, I think that's part of the political problem. It insulates the uh, people at the federal level from having that impact. So um, I, I agree. I haven't done a specific uh, look at what the, you know, certainly nothing very large on the impact locally. But, um, but, but they are very serious uh, when people... Well, when, when you see libraries shutting down, when you see um, particularly, well, virtually all women's organizations, which, which had very, very important functions in the past, uh, no longer receive, they don't receive any kind of help now, and either provincially or federally, in, in, I mean, provincially in my, in my case, uh, or federally. So that becomes a more and more serious issue for people who are both helping each other and helping themselves. We'll pay for it. Hélène Leblanc, députée de la salle et mar euh, et présidente du comité permanent de la condition féminine et porte-parole des coopératives. Euh, J'ai euh, bien entendu euh, votre, euh, votre présentation. Je vous remercie beaucoup. Euh, la fin est assez, euh, assez euh, prenante dans le sens de dire que euh, le, le « people euh, at risk » et « people as risk ». J'aimerais euh, que vous élaboriez un peu de votre perspective pour les générations futures, parce que c'est vraiment les budgets d'austérité qu'on présente, c'est dans le futur également qu'il va y avoir un impact. Euh, et comment euh, on peut euh, engager les, les, les jeunes euh, présentement à pouvoir euh, s'engager euh, pour pouvoir trouver des solutions euh, et pouvoir s'engager justement euh, en politique pour faire en sorte qu'on puisse entendre leur voix. Parce que de plus en plus, ils se retirent, euh, il me semble, par exemple, euh, de... de de, de voter ou encore de s'impliquer politiquement. Alors, euh, comment vous voyez ça euh, dans l'avenir et comment on pourrait trouver des, des solutions à ce moment-là? Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, very struck by your last slide, the notion of people at risk, but we have had a series of austerity budgets going back a long way. Uh, the question really is, how does one uh, think about the future and have people re-engage in a future when, in fact, uh, the argument is that they've been told, in a sense, to step back, and they have indeed pulled back in voting, etc. So, do you have any suggestions about how to help people re-engage in the more positive view, I suppose, that you were articulating at the, in the early part of your presentation? The great difficulty is that this is part of a bigger system. Um, and the bigger system is the way we've kind of commercialized everything in the world through trade agreements. So that um, the trade agreements kind of kind of propel expansion of markets at exactly the time when they need to contract at least so that we can save the planet for, <laughs> from, uh, from climate change and the people within it. So I, I do think that there will be something that will spark um, some kind of political reactions that's going to be strong enough to overcome this idea that that balanced budgets and low taxes are the best thing we can possibly expect from governments. So um, I, climate change may very well be one of these because uh, all sorts of people who I see who were unlikely uh, political activists in the past now are on this issue. And I think this is important. In Canada, we're fairly primitive at this so far. We are only looking at what it means in certain industries, the resource industries, and what it means in... Um, in oil extraction, for example, uh, basically male type jobs, not very many of them. But we've got to expand this and to think that providing what people need is not damaging to the economy. It, if you're going to provide services that people need, it's good for the environment too. <laughs> There is a way to have different kinds of participation in an economy. And 
these tend to be jobs where women are dominant right now, by the way. And so when we're looking at climate change, we need to look at all the kinds of works, work that are happening. So right now, I do not see... I mean, this is such an important question because... I think a lot of people are discouraged and do not... I think they're so distant from their governments now because they have... They get little from them. Uh, if they're unemployed, they do. Uh, you know, if they're, in, in, uh, if they're very old and get old-age pensions, they do. But otherwise, they have little contact with their governments. So, uh, but they do are demanding now that something happen around uh, climate change, and this may be a change. I forgot to add one point, Jim, excuse, uh, just a particular focus on re-engagement of youth. I think it's implicit in what you were saying, but I think there, the interest was there. Actually, I am seeing this in the universities. There has been a period of time when there was not much engagement of youth, in, at least in my university, um, uh, or there were, there were just a few people who are, But I'm seeing more activism in the universities now, and it's ju not just around tuition fees, it's, uh, which is important, by the way. I, I don't mean to dismiss that. That is an extremely important thing because that has been the strength of Canada, that we've had uh, reasonable costs to higher education. But I am seeing it more on social issues issues uh, around climate change, and I'm seeing it around gendered issues as well for both males and females. So I do think that there is a reason to be hopeful there. Um, I'm Ruel Amder, and I write for Canadian Charger. Uh, the um, thing that I found uh, particularly interesting in your talk was uh, your description of what essentially is downloading where cuts at the federal level lead to the provincial level and from there to the municipal. And uh, the thing about municipal is that it is reliant on the property tax, mm -hmm. which is uh, particularly regressive. Yeah. Um, well, that's an important point. Um, by the way, there, not all provinces are, uh, are taking the federal government direction around austerity, and some are a little bit better than others and are a little bit more supportive. At least it looks like that from way out on the West Coast. <laughs> uh, we're very envious of the, of the child care policy in, in Quebec, for example. But, um, you know, but, but this is extremely important that if you only have property tax, uh, that becomes that becomes a very hard way to uh, to do anything. We do see that we have some small measures in the in this budget for the current budget for um, for transportation and infrastructure. Uh, they aren't going to go far enough for what the what is needed. Uh, if anybody's been driving in Toronto lately, it's terrible. <laughs> Um, so we do, we do need different kinds of, of programs, but we need a federal government that cares about people and that can think of things in a positive kind of way and isn't just saying, let's just leave it to people at the bottom. They'll take care of it and they'll figure another way to raise taxes. In, in, uh, in Vancouver, what we're doing, this is another one of those things that people are clamoring for public uh, transport. So what we're doing is institute, instituting a sales tax just for Vancouver area. Um, at least that is, now we have a referendum for that, you probably know. But unfortunately, this is what's happening. That's also a regressive tax. So we're finding more and more shift to sales taxes of one sort or another and regressive taxes. And that's not a way to finance the future. Uh, while we're waiting to see if there's anyone else who'd like to pose a question, I had one question, which is uh, on an issue that uh, you didn't focus upon, uh, but I'm interested in your observations, and that is whether or not uh, the demographics that governments today face, which are quite different from the demographics of the 1960s and 70s, uh, are having a significant uh, influence on how public policy is being cast. If you have uh, the potential for smaller labor pools, the potential for more people who require forms of, we'll call it social investment or social spending, uh, and yet you've got an economy that hasn't been growing, is there, is there a kind of reinforcement through demographics of some of the trends that you articulated, or, or how, do you, how do you resist that, I suppose? I think the big issue is that as we have rising inequality, we're going to have 
a very different looking population, and I think that is an important part. Um, we do have increase in immigration, but the people who are coming into the country now are either pretty skilled or have money, except for refugees. So that's a different group of people who, if we have work for them, can take care of themselves. Um, there are there are more women graduating from universities. Um, there is an older population, which um, which will be an issue in the future. I think particularly around things like chronic care. Uh, that's one area we always have a good health care system in Canada, or at least we think so. But a very large proportion of it is, pro is in the private sector, and people are going to uh, increasingly have trouble as they age over having appropriate kinds of health care. So uh, the demographics, I think, are, are something to contend with. Um, I don't think that the way we're doing it by increasing, uh, in increasing tax breaks, um, particularly with the savings accounts and so on, is going to be the way that's going to solve that particular demographic problem. I mean, they really, we, everybody knows there needs to be an expansion of the CPP and the old age supplement, but these are not happening. At least it doesn't look like it. We're spending money in other ways down into the future. So we do have to worry about what that is going to mean. I imagine some government will uh, get into... Um, well, I always think of this as like the stages of grief. You know, there are five stages of grief. And you go through, you know, the, um, I, I, f I forget, there's denial. I think that was us in the 1980s when Thatcher and Reagan were wrecking countries there. There was denial. Then there was, then there was anger. I think that was the whole anti-free trade movement when we didn't want more of that kind of thing. And, uh, and then the, the third stage, stage of, of grief is bargaining, and I think that's where we are now, where we're kind of um, trying to figure out how we can do something within the constraints that governments are using now. So maybe there will be some limit put on the, the tax-free savings account so you can't have people amassing fortunes there without having it taxed. Maybe. That's the bargaining stage. And I think after that, it's depression and then acceptance, but I hope we don't get to those stages. <laughs> And on that happy note, I think we'll, <laughs> we'll conclude. Thank you so much uh, for uh, your uh, very uh, interesting responses to, uh, to our questions. And I'd like to thank you, uh, Professor Cohen, for joining us today and providing us for really a lot to think about. Um, Professor Cohen is our final speaker in the Big Thinking uh, series on the Hill uh, Breakfast this season. Uh, we've been celebrating 20 years of Big Thinking on the Hill, and we've been delighted to bring back many speakers uh, who have been really highlights over the years, really challenging speakers uh, in two decades of presenting to parliamentarians. I'd like to present you, uh, Marjorie, if I may, with this very small token of our thanks uh, for your presentation this morning. Thanks very much. Et merci encore au uh, CRSH pour leur soutien uh, précieux tout au long uh, de cette uh, série. Merci également à James Rajat, notre député parrain de la série de causeries Voir Grande. C'est grâce à Monsieur Rajat uh, que ces événements peuvent se tenir dans le magnifique restaurant Parlement. Thank you all for joining us for today's conversation with Marjorie Griffin Cohen, and a video of her presentation will shortly be available on the website of the Federation. Now, although uh, Big Thinking on the Hill closes for the season, there are other high-profile Big Thinking lectures which will take place at the 84th Congress of the Humanities uh, and Social Sciences to take place from May 30th to June 5th right here at the University of Ottawa. So it encourage all of you uh, to come by. Speakers include Justice Murray Sinclair, Chair of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, Trudeau Fellow Jean Leclerc, who will address how our federal state can effectively engage in a process of reconciliation with Aboriginal peoples, and celebrated Iranian-American author Azar Nafisi on the critical role of the humanities for the future of our democracies. Lots of information is available about the Congress on the website at www.congress2015.ca 
www.congrès2015.ca uh, pour la version française. You can pick up a Congress 2015 brochure as well right at the registration desk. So we hope that all of you will join us for uh, all or part of the Congress. Merci encore une fois et bonne journée à tous. Thank you very much, everyone.